Everyone knows about the Tartars. They live in Tartarstan, eat a puck and hang out at the Summer Festival Sabatui. Those who didn't fall asleep in history class might be able to say something about the Golden Horde, the Tartar Yoke, or the importance of the Battle of Kutikovo Plain in Russian history. But did you know that Genghis Khan actually came from the clan of the so-called Black Tartars? Or that the Golden Horde actually operated as a federation? And what if we told you that neither the Tartar Yoke nor the Battle of Kilikovo Plain ever happened? So, let's go back and try to figure out where the people who became the Tartars came from. This is the Great Steppe around 300 BC. For the Tartars, the steppe is as much of a civilizational cradle as the Mediterranean Sea is for Europeans. But if the Mediterranean Sea makes you think of olives, vineyards, and ships, then the Great Steppe should provoke visions of horses, pastures, and yurts. Around this same time, the Alexandrian Library was founded in Egypt. The great mathematician Erastanes calculated the diameter of the Earth, and the letter G appeared in the Latin alphabet. In Europe, nothing interesting was really going on. At the same time, the Chinese were building their Great Wall to protect themselves against the attacks of the nomadic tribes of the Xiongnu, the nomadic ancestors of the Tartars. The Xiongnu hated any kind of wall or obstacle. Their strength was in their mobility and ability to quickly concentrate forces in the right place and at the right time. A nomad is a dynamic, pragmatic, and inventive person. Nomads invented the stirrup and were the first to put on pants and sit in the saddle. The European fashion of wearing trousers came from the Huns. Nomadic weapons included the saber and bow and arrows. A saber is lighter than a knight's sword. With one swing of its blade, a nomad standing in the stirrup could easily cut down his enemy. A nomad's wife could assemble a yurt in two hours and tear it down in 30 minutes. In the winter, a yurt was warm, and in the summer, it kept cool. Large yurts were put on carts and hauled by buffalo. From a distance, they looked like a city moving along the steppe. The dome of the Khan's yurt was covered with gold. The Khan's headquarters was known as the Golden Horde. The nomads believed in a single god of the boundless sky and sun, Tangri. They slaughtered cattle and sacrificed them in a large boiling cauldron known as Akazan. The head of the clan, surrounded by the entire tribe, carried out the sacrificial rituals. Who was a nomad's best friend? A horse, of course. Each male nomad had at least four horses which could serve as transportation, housing, and food. The classic Tartar horse was unpretentious, ate fodder, and could travel hundreds of kilometers in both heat and cold. The Xiongnu's rule lasted for just one century before collapsing as a result of wars and internal conflicts. Some of those left went to the southern steppe while others moved north, settling between the Volga River and the Ural Mountains. In Europe, they became known as the Huns. In the 4th century, the Huns united under Attila, invading Europe and conquering territory from present-day Chilayabinsk to Munich, simultaneously prompting the Great Migration of Nations. Attila's luck ran out fighting the Goths in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. Many of his people then settled in Crimea. One can still find traces of the Huns in the genes of Bavarian barons. Attila was preparing to settle in the territory of present-day Hungary and rule his empire from there, but his young wife poisoned him. After Attila's death, the alliance of the Huns disintegrated. In the 6th century, the Turks grew in strength, having learned how to forge incredibly strong sabers thanks to their unique method of melting ore at a temperature of 1400 degrees. The Turks created the Turkic Khaganate. Over the course of a century, they conquered the lands along the Silk Road, bringing all international trade under their control. Turkic language and culture spread alongside gold, silver, furs, spices, and silks traveling on camel caravans. Beginning in 522, the Turks began using runic writing. They read in columns, like on this epitaph, carved in stone in honor of the Prince Kul Tegin of the Second Turkic Kagaganate. The Turkic Kagaganate began diplomatic relations with the Chinese who wrote the first accounts of the Tartars. The Chinese divided the Tartars into three types, white Tartars, farmers living immediately beyond the Great Wall of China, black Tartars, nomads living in present-day Mongolia, and wild Tartars living without Khans in the forests of South Siberia, governed by chiefs and shamans. These Tartar tribes formed six Tartar states. In the 6th century, the Turkic Kagaganate weakened and split into Western and Eastern Kagaganates. In the East, the Kimak and Kipchak tribes founded the Kimak Khanate. 
In the west, Bulgar tribes established Great Bulgaria, led by Kubert Khan in the Black Sea region. Everything then went as Tolstoy described in his story, Father and Sons. If you live in harmony, no one will prevail against you. But if you quarrel, everything will fall apart and you will be easily ruined. Kubrick Khan's sons divided the horde amongst themselves, preventing anyone from having the strength to repel the attacks of the nearby Khazar Gaganid. Great Bulgaria lasted only 50 years. Asparuch, Kubrick's third son, went to the lower Danube and there formed the Danube Bulgaria with its capital in Pliska. This is modern-day Bulgaria, whose capital is in Sofia. Kutrog, Kubrick's second son, went north. There, where the Volga and the Kama rivers met, he founded the Volga Bulgaria state, with its capital in the city of Bulgar. In 922, at the invitation of Iltibar Almush, an emissary from Baghdad arrived in Volga Bulgaria, marking the region's official adoption of Islam. The secretary of the ambassador, Ibn Fadlan, wrote a very detailed account of his journey. By the way, Rus, which would later become Russia, adopted Christianity only 66 years later. Volga Bulgaria was a developed state at the intersection of two major trade routes, the Northern Fur Route and the Great Volga Route. One branch of the Silk Road even extended to Bilgar and Bulgar. Here, one could easily stop and say, these Bulgars are clearly the ancestors of the Tartars. But it's not so simple. What we see in boulders today is built during Batu's reign. So, we'll continue. These are the ancestral lands of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan came from the Black Tartars. He called his dynasty the Mongols, or the Great Mughals. They lacked the stereotypical ethnic features that you think of today. Genghis Khan himself was tall, red-haired, and blue-eyed, a typical European. In 25 years, Genghis Khan and 100,000 soldiers conquered more lands and peoples than all the Roman emperors in 400 years. How did he do it? At that time, there were two systems for empire building, the Roman way and the Eurasian way, Roman law and the Great Yaza, the code of laws established by Genghis Khan. Roman citizenship could only be bestowed upon a free man at least 25 years of age, the head of a family and a resident of the Roman Empire, and from Roman society. Emperor Augustus set a dress code for himself, whereas other inhabitants of the Roman state had to wear a toga. Pants, considered an item of barbaric clothing, were barred from Rome. Society was divided into citizens, non-citizens, and slaves. All who were outside the state were classified as barbarians. The hierarchy was unshakable. Everything was designed to strengthen vertical power, at the top of which sat the Roman emperor and his legions. All cities, even those built in the middle of deserts, were made to mirror Rome in terms of their laws, values, theaters, aqueducts, and stadiums for gladiatorial fights. Eurasia was under a completely different system. At the age of 16, Genghis Khan began forming an inner circle based not on the principle of kinship, but personal devotion. This is how those who were born at the wrong time or in the wrong family could move up the career ladder. Genghis Khan's plan was simple, conquer a tribe, liquidate its leadership, and compel those who remained to join his army and pay tribute. In return, he promised protection from attacks and offered full autonomy in religion, culture, and agriculture. It was a tempting offer. The alternative was certain death. Genghis Khan quickly conquered so many lands that he had to invent a way of bringing order to the population. Genghis Khan wrote a code of laws known as the Great Yaza. In a word, it declared all peoples, religions, and cultures equal. There was no single religion in the Golden Horde, though everyone was under strict orders to honor and fear their own god, whomever that might be. Priests of all faiths were exempt from taxes. It was easy to hide sins from human eyes, but how could one hide from God? Peace in the steppe was maintained through the principles of equality and tolerance. Though democratic in domestic politics, Genghis Khan recognized only submission in his foreign policy. Prior to military operations, he sent diplomats to announce an ultimatum and non-negotiable conditions for surrender. Any city that killed an ambassador was subject to destruction. The entire male population of the Golden Horde formed the army. From birth, a citizen of the Golden Horde knew only his place in the hierarchy. Everything in the system was kept simple. Warriors were divided into tens, hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands. 
Only a single male heir in a line was exempt from serving in the army so that a clan would not be interrupted. The Russian princes appointed by the Great Khan either paid taxes or served in the army. In return, they benefited from secured borders, safe roads from Crimea to China, and a stable financial system. In this way, the Golden Horde, later nicknamed by the Russians the Tartar Yoke, lasted until the 15th century. After a time of troubles, the plague, and the invasion of Tamerlane, the empire began to weaken. Cities such as the capital of Saray began to die out. Its function passed to the city of crime, now Stari Crime, which claimed the legacy of the Golden Horde. At the same time, Moscow entered the political arena as a formidable contender. A fragile union between crime, Moscow, and Kazan exited throughout Eurasia until the fall of Kazan and Ostrakhan. In 1552, Ivan the Terrible sacked Kazan. The year before, he built a military base in nearby Shvyask. Everybody in the region took sides, either with Moscow or Kazan. Ivan the Terrible attacked Kazan with the cavalry of the Kazim Khanat's leader, Shal Ali. Ivan the Terrible had an army of 150,000 people and 150 cannons. In Kazan, he was opposed by 33,000 soldiers. Using gunpowder, Ivan blew up the city wall and stormed in. St. Basil's Cathedral, standing in Moscow's Red Square, commemorates this event. When Kazan fell, the Tartars lost their statehood. The Ostrakhan Khanat subsequently fell, followed by the Siberian Khanat and later the Crimean, after which the Tartar factor faded from the world arena. The myth of Queen Siumbiki is connected with the capture of Kazan. On. She allegedly refused to marry the Tsar and leapt to her death from the tower that now bears her name. In fact, the tower was built in the early 18th century and Sayambiki was married in 1551 before the capture of Kazan. She lived out her years with her husband Shah Ali. The Tsardom of Kazan came into existence, governed personally by Ivan the Terrible. He created the Kazan diocese, which forcibly baptized some Tartars. Tartar soldiers established new lives for themselves and for their warriors from the cities of Kashira, Kolomna, and Serpikov. In 1708, the Tsardom of Kazan was transformed into Kazan province under the authority of Count Peter Apraxin, a close friend of Peter the Great. From 1733 to 1774, the province was caught up in a peasant war. Tartars flocked to the aid of the Cossack Emelian Pukachev, who even tried to capture Kazan. In the 18th century, the era of capitalism, Tartar elite became successful businessmen and industrialists, making leather, soap, textiles, and paper sold throughout Russia, China, and Central Asia. The most successful brands included Arsk Fabric, which accounted for about 50% of the Russian market. The Apanyav, Yuzyanov, Azimov, Barnayev, Yuzmanov families got richer, but they also took care of their people, building mosques, schools, and places for public leisure that remain today. By the end of the 19th century, an ideological split emerged among the leaders of the nation. Some Tartars, known as Kadimists, wanted to hold on to patriarchal traditions. Their opponents, known as Jadidists, favored Europe and Turkey, secular education, and Western fashion. First and foremost among Jadidists was Gabdullah Tukai. Jadidists published newspapers, printed books, and founded theatrical troops and clubs. During this time, Tartars dressed as we imagine them now, with Tayabatikas, Ichigi, Kalfiks, and Camisols. Their clothing featured lots of embroidery and jewelry. On the table, one could find Ipachmak, Lapsha, Perimayesh, Chakchak, and Kaistibi. On special events, they competed in the wrestling style known as Koresh. During the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, Tartars declared the independent idle Ural state, their first attempt at creating a national government. Mulinar Vakitov and Mursad Sultangliev then proposed a united Tartar Bakshir Republic, though in 1920 the Tartar Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was founded. Sultangliev's idea of Islamic socialism became the guiding ideology for third world liberation movements. Tartars made a huge contribution to the victory over fascism. Of the 11,519 Soviet soldiers named heroes of the Soviet Union, Tartars made up the fourth largest group. The sacrifice of the poet Musa Chalhil as he suffered and died in a Nazi prison personified the fighting spirit, bravery, and patriotism of the Soviet people. The country's most important military industrial base was located in Tartarstan too. Science and culture continued to grow in the Tartar Republic. The oil, petrochemical, aviation production, automotive, agricultural, and other industries flourished during these years. Academic achievements and science helped the Republic become one of the most industrially developed regions in the Soviet Union. Tartar culture, particularly music, literature, and theater blossomed. 
The next stage was 1990, which marked the declaration of the state sovereignty of the Republic of Tatarstan. Tatarstan is now in its third decade as an independent subject within Russia, strengthened by its own history, politics, economy, culture, international relations, and sports. It is home to successful petrochemical, construction, automotive, aviation, and agricultural industries. What else can one say?